And welcome back to our weekly roundup. This is our special show having to do with Canada. And once again, I'm joined by my friend and my co-host, Laura, who is based in Canada. So, Laura, how are you doing? I'm good, Mark. Thank you. Blessing to be here as always. And unfortunately, Laura, we're going to be talking about a lot of um, very evil stuff today, a lot of bad stuff. It's, um, it's mm -hmm. just amazing um, how much Canada has fallen over the last 15 years or so. You know, as I said a few days ago, Canada was once seen as our quiet and um, sleepy neighbor to the north. But over the last 15 to 17 years, you guys have been making a lot of waves and um, not in a good manner. You know, you guys have had a lot of um, influence on America in a lot of social, um, in a lot of social issues, and it's just, um, it's just incredible to see um, what Canada has become. You know, a few days ago, a brother said that Canada has basically become the Sweden of North America, and how true he was. You know, um, if anybody who knows anything about Sweden knows that anything goes in Sweden, and I mean anything. It is one of the most, if not the most, liberal nation on the um, on the planet, and um, I think Canada is sadly going in that direction. So, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot of um, very grieving stuff today, but um, and um, let me just say that we're not going to belabor at these points, but we just want to show you just how far Canada has fallen um, in such a very short time. And I know, Laura, that uh, as someone who lives in Canada, that is very grieving to you. Yeah, it is, Mark. It's, I've been thinking about it, and um, I'm going to personally change the <laughs> the Canadian anthem from O Canada to O O Canada. Oh. Yes, sadly, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not laughing because it's funny. It's just, it's crazy what's right. going on. Right. And so. let me say up front right now that um, all the articles that we're going to be mentioning, um, we're going to have links to these articles in the information box. So you can click on these things and you can see these things for yourself. You can read them for yourselves. Because as I said, we're not going to belabor a lot of these points, but we just want to bring you um, these things just so you have an idea as to what's going on in Canada. And, um, you know, before we start, let me just say, by the way, you know, in the 1960s, America experienced a sexual revolution and it had a profound effect on the nation and also I think in many of the nations and I think just over the last 15 to 17 years you know Canada um, you know Canada has gone through its own sexual revolution and just as how America's um, sexual revolution really affected the country in a horrendous way I think we see the exact same thing happening in, in Canada and we're gonna see a lot of that um, today as, as we go through a lot of these articles um, so it is sad to see. And, you know, in starting, let me just say that the very first time that I really started paying attention to what was going on in Canada was in the very early 2000s. I think it was around 2001, where I read about a guy, a brother in, Sas in Saskatchewan, um, you know, that's a, that's a province in Canada. He took out an ad in one of the local newspapers, and all he did was he mentioned four scriptures having to do with homosexuality. He mentioned two scriptures in Leviticus, um, one in Romans chapter 1 and one in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And he was fined $4,500 for it uh, because it was deemed as hate speech. Now, he didn't even quote the whole scriptures. All he did was quoted the scripture references, and he was, um, he was fined for that, um, and it was uh, considered to be hate speech. And what really woke me up was just a few years after that, when Canada became the first country um, outside of Europe and the fourth country in the world to approve of gay marriage. And I think many of us in America, Laura, really woke up after that because we realized it was just a matter of time before it came here to America because there were many states at the time that were trying to um, get um, homosexual uh, marriage approved. And um, there was a huge pushback in America um, because of that. But we knew that if Canada went in that direction, it was just a matter of time before America went in that direction. And less than 10 years later, we now have a homosexual marriage in America. It is now the law of the land. And I think a lot of that had to do with Canada and the influence that Canada had on America. Yeah, and I guess we're neighbors, so it's it's going to happen eventually, right, Mark? Right, right. You know, it's funny, um, where America is the one that usually um, is the one that has led in as far as influence goes but you know now we've seen the difference um, we've seen the change where Canada is now leading America in many of the social issues but again those are the two things that really woke me up the 
the um, event that happened in, in Saskatchewan with the brother who took out the ad in the newspaper and also gay marriage being legalized in 2005 in Canada. And, you know, the Laura, we knew, of course, that uh, when that happened, that the floodgates would be open to all mm-hmm. sorts of deviancy. And, you know, I know that um, I want to talk about the first thing I want to talk about now is the fact that uh, the Supreme Court in Canada, not some little local court, but the Supreme Court in Canada um, just a couple of years ago basically came out and said that most bestiality is now legal. And again, it was not some little court that ruled that, but it was the Supreme Court in Canada that, that ruled that most bestiality in the country is legal. I'd like you to to, to talk about that because I know you have an article on that um, on that topic. Yeah, I do. Um, I'll just read a little bit of it here. It's from the Globe and Mail, uh, June thirteenth, two thousand sixteen. It was published. So it says here the last uh, the parliamentaries who wrote the Canada's bestiality law understood the word to imply the physical penetration of an animal, and it is not the role of jurists to broaden the definition. To include other acts. The country's top court ruled Thursday. In a decision that was supported by all but one of seven justices, the Supreme Court upheld the acquittal of a British Columbian man who was charged with bestiality after compelling the family dog to sexually abuse his 16-year-old stepdaughter. Lawyers for the man, who was also convicted of 13 counts of sexually molesting his two stepdaughters over a 10-year period, argued that the 1954 law prohibiting bestiality had a specific meaning, vagina or anal penetration of an animal. The Supreme Court justices agreed, saying it would be appropriate for courts to expand the definition beyond what was intended by the polit- politicians uh, who dragged the legislation. Mm. So um, it says here that the man from Prince George who cannot be identified was sentenced to 16 years for all the offenses upon which he was convicted, including two related to the bestiality count. Mm. So basically what they're saying is that um, you can pretty much do any kind of sexual act with an animal as long as there's no penetration, right? And as long as there's no penetration, it's not technically bestiality. That's pretty much what they're saying. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, these people are sick, really. I mean, this is this is sick. Um, they may be trying to say that without penetration is not real bestiality, but this is. Um, but any other kind of sexual act um, is permissible. I mean, that these people are these people are insane. Um, and these are the justices. Again, this was not ruled by some little local court in Canada. This was ruled by the Supreme Court. And um, the very fact that they would basically say that any kind of act, with the exception of um, penetration, is permissible is just um, it's just bizarre to me. You know, it's just yeah. bizarre, and it's just wicked, and it's opening up the door for for all sorts of even all sorts of wickedness because it's just a matter of time before bestiality does become legal in that country, and also here in America too. We have issues with that very thing here in America too. I know in Washington, uh, they have in, in the state of Washington, they have a place where um, a farm where where people can go and people can have sex with animals. I know they had an issue with that, and um, I believe it was in Ohio several several years ago. There was also a farm or a place you could go to. And again, this is just opening up the floodgates to, yeah. to all sorts of even, all sorts of wickedness. I mean, when you get to the point of um, having um, sexual acts, even if it's not intercourse, but some kind of sexual act with um, with with animals, I mean, you are just, um, you talk about being given over to a depraved mind. It's just mm-hmm. sick. It is. I agree, Mark. I didn't know about the farm in Washington. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. When you go through scriptures, you will see that one of the reasons why um, the Jews were given the land of Canaan, Canaan was because the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and all of these other ites that were living in the land, one of, their, um, one of the gross sins that they were committing was bestiality. You know, the Bible makes it very clear when you go to the book of Leviticus and also Deuteronomy, it talks about the fact that uh, they were committing um, not just homosexuality and a lot of um, um, idol worshiping and whatever, but they, um, but bestiality was also very common during that time. And so God made it very clear that that was one of the reasons he was kicking those people out of the land and giving the land to the Jews because of their wicked sins of bestiality. And um, um, it just shows you that human nature does not change. You know, it does not change at all. I mean, men were born sinners. And once, um, once we go down that road of, um, 
you know, again, um, accepting any kind of sexual um, deviancy. It's just a matter of it, it just um, there's no end to how far and how um, how low we will descend. Right. Like the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm. In the Old Testament. Um, yeah. But anyway, this is um, I want to kind of get off that topic okay. because it's a it's a pretty filthy and vile topic. Um, and it's just sad to see what the Supreme Court um, has ruled in that um, in that area. Sorry, I just wanted to warn people when if you do read the article about the bestiality, just be warned ahead of time that it's there's some details in there you probably don't want to know, so you might not want to even read it. Right. Um, another thing that um, that just recently happened in Canada, Laura, was um, the very first baby uh, born without a gender designation. Apparently, this uh, baby was born, and the parents decided that uh, they would not um, give the baby a designation, whether boy or or girl. Uh, I'd like you to talk more about that. That's right. Um, it says uh, an eight month an eight month old Canadian baby has been issued a health card without a gender marker. It could be the first case in the world. Uh, parent Corey Doughty, a non-binary transgender person who identifies as neither male nor female, aims to allow the child to discover their own gender. The health card has been issued with a U in the space for sex, which could be for undetermined or unassigned. Corey Dottie is fighting to omit the gender from the birth certificate. The parent gave birth to Sarah Atley in November at a friend's home in British Columbia. Corey Dottie, who prefers to use the pronoun they, argues that a visual inspection at birth is unable to determine what gender that person will have or identity with later in life. They want to keep Sarah's sex off all official records. I mean, these people have gone mad. First of all, you have a transgender woman um, who gave birth to a baby. So she's already messed up in, in the mind. She doesn't know if she's a man or a woman or whatever. So she's already um, completely messed up in the mind. And now when the baby was born, despite the fact that the baby was born with a male organ or, or a female sexual organ, um, she – this – parent has decided or the parents have decided that they will not designate a ba the baby either a boy or a girl simply because they don't want to um they don't want to do that they, they want the child to make up their own mind as to whether or not they're a boy or girl this is absolute insanity Th yeah. this is madness and yet um, the government is going along with this this is I, insane to me i i know i couldn't imagine being a young child trying to decide what gender i am you know like that would mess you up mm. this is just insane to me but yet the government is approving this. I mean, this this um, parent, the parents need to be in a mental institution because they're insane. We know it's a spiritual issue, right? Ab absolutely, absolutely. You know, that's why I said I'm just saying that facetiously. But in the end, you know, w what this shows is that um, these people have been completely blinded by the enemy. They are completely blinded by Satan, and they need to come to the foot of the cross. They need to be saved. They need to be born again. They need to. Um, for the Holy Spirit to, to cut away their stony hearts and be given a heart of flesh because these people are just, uh, they're completely blind to the truth and Satan has blinded their eyes and um, sadly the kids are paying a price for this. Um, yeah, that's, that's exactly it, Mark. It's really sad mm. to see all this happening. Yeah. On the subject of kids, you know, um, there's also the third thing I want to cover is the fact that um, that uh, there's a new law in Canada that basically says that uh, kids could be removed um, from their parents if the parents reject uh, the transgender ideology. Like, I'd like you to, um, to speak more on that, um, Laura. I'm just going to read a bit of the article, Mark. Mm -hmm. So it says here, Canada's most populous province, Ontario, just passed a law that could allow the government to remove kids from their home if their parents oppose the new transgender ideology. Um, so Ontario has passed five gender laws in the past few five years, few of which received much media attention or even opposed opposition in the legislation. Bill 89 is the latest in this litany of bad legislation. So basically, um, the bill, which is about foster care and adoption, uh, basically can take them out of the out of the home, out of the you know you probably won't even be allowed to adopt. Because I'm sure that they screen you, mm -hmm. you know, thoroughly. And if you probably say that you're against it, they probably won't even let you adopt. You know, it mm -hmm. would probably go that far. I'm sure, Mark. 
Well, and I'm sure, too, obviously it's going to be affecting Christians more than anyone else, right? Because right. Christians are the ones who have spoken out about this whole transgender, homosexual ideology. I mean, the Christians are the ones who speak out more than anyone else. We're the ones who raise our, um, who raise our voices. And um, the fact of the matter is that it's not the Sikhs, it's not the Buddhists, it's not the Hindus, it's not the Muslims who are speaking out against these things. It's the Bible-believing Christians. And so I'm sure that the Christians are the ones who are going to be affected, where if a, if a Christian family um, is fostering a, um, a child and, um, and they you know, start teaching the, the, the child that you know transgenderism and all these things are um, evil and they're wicked the child that they are sponsoring and fostering could be removed from their home so I, th I see this as something being directed um, specifically at the Christians that the Christians are the ones who are going to um, who are going to uh, pay the price more than anyone else oh absolutely it also says here that it's estimated that half of all foster families are practicing Christians mm -hmm. so there you go right um, do you want me to mention the five bills that are that are been passed? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so there's uh, Bill 13, um, also in 2012, compelled public schools to have gay-straight alliances and demanded schools combat homophobia and transphobia. Bill 77 in 2015 prohibited particular forms of therapy for minors who struggle with gender dysphoria or other aspects of their sexuality against the advice of numerous psychiatrists and counselors. Bill 28, which passed into law in December 2016, removed the terms mother and father from Ontario law and oh. permits preconception agreements, allowing four unrelated and unmarried people to become parents. And Bill 89 is a bill, uh, child protection bill that aims to make changes to our foster care and adoption system across Ontario. It regulates the child's aid societies, which includes over 40 organizations across the province responsible for uh, responding to child protection concerns. So those are a few bills. It just breaks my heart listening to this, um, listen to what you just read. I mean, again, you wonder why the kids are so messed up today. You know, this well, is what they're learning. They're learning a lot of these things from the adults. And um, I mean, you and I never had to deal with stuff like this in school. The idea of even dealing with these things is just bizarre to me and because, I mean, I graduated from high school years ago and these things were not even mentioned. And yet mm -hmm. this is what the kids are having to go through. I mean, they're, they're pushing this kind of ideology on the kids. And it's amazing. You cannot even bring a Bible in school and, um, and speak to people about the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can bring in all sorts of deviancy and all sorts of evil and it's okay. Okay, and we are the ones who are seen as the hate mongers. The Christians are seen as the hate mongers, and the people who are who are teaching all of this evil are the ones who are seen as the ones as um, enlightened. I mean, you talk about everything being upside down. It's um, it's just grieving, and it's um, it's evil. I mean, we need to call it what it is. This is just evil. What's happening and what they're doing to the children. It is. It's child abuse, you know, and not even all the transgender stuff, but just basically even, I'll just give you an example. Like a friend of mine came to me and she was all upset um, because her daughter had to go up in front of the school and describe what an erection was. Oh. And amongst, like, the, the, and the, the parent knew that she was going to have sex ed, but she didn't um, know what it was all about. And so the daughter so came home and she's all distraught. She's like 13 years old. She didn't. Could you imagine? I mean, yeah. it's... It's terrible. You know, the parents should be doing that, not not schools. It shouldn't be in the schools. Right. But anyway, right. Just, uh, you know, it goes yeah. beyond. This. It's just what they're teaching the kids and allowing, right? Yeah. There's also another bill that talks about Canadians um, facing hate crimes charges or even prison for um, anti-transgender speech that basically if you um, if you come out and you say that you don't agree with with transgenderism and you speak out against it like many Christians do they could be charged with a hate crime and they possibly could go to prison for that I know you have an article uh, dealing with that very thing yeah you mean kind of like what we're doing right now yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> okay yeah it says your Canada's Senate has passed a law against the use of wrong gender pronouns which critics say would allow authorities to charge those who deny gender theory with hate crimes leading to imprisonment, fines, or anti-bias training. 
Bill C-16 passed by a vote of 67 to 11 this week, more than a year after being introduced, according to Global News, which said it adds protection of gender identity and expression to the Canadian Human Rights Code and includes them within the protections provided by the hate speech and hate crime provisions of the criminal law. Uh, the measure now awaits royal assent from the House of Commons. So it says here that the purpose of this legislation is to ensure that everyone can live according to their gender identity and express their gender as they choose. It will protect people from discrim discrimination, hate propaganda, and hate crimes. Um, I'm just going to mention there was a few, uh, some people tweeted and there was some uh, good tweets here. Uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, um, an invitee to the Senate committee, had earlier told the committee that the bill was an unprecedented threat to the freedom of expression. We will seriously regret this, he said. Um, somebody else said it. This tyrannical bill is nothing but social engineering to the ninth degree, all in the name of political correctness. Um, it's Vice President Jeff Gunnarsson told LifeSite News. And um, another one here, mark my words, this law will not be used as some sort of shield to defend vulnerable transsexuals, but rather as a weapon with which to bludgeon people of faith and free thinking Canadians who refuse to deny truth. Uh, that was from the group's senior political strategist, Jack Forsaka, was quoted as saying. I just wanted to mention those. Many of these laws, um, if not most of these laws, are directed at Christians, even though they don't come out and say it, because, of course, who are the ones who speak up the most about these things? The Christians. The Christians are the ones. We are the ones who've been raising our voices. We're the ones who've been, like, blowing the trumpet and telling people um, the truth of of these things, you know, the transgenderism and, and um, homosexuality and all of these different things. It's the Christians. It's not the Sikhs. It's not the Hindus. It's not the Buddhists. It's not any of these people. It's the Christians. And so a lot of these laws, the underlining thing for a lot of these laws is they're directed at Christians. They're directed at silencing Christians, silencing our voices. And um, I agree with a lot of those, a lot of the tweets that you just uh, read about because they are absolutely correct. These laws will come back to haunt us and to come back and haunt people of faith, I mean, uh, Bible-believing Christians, and they're going to use these laws to eventually um, arrest and lock up Christians. Make no, make no mistake about it. I mean, we see the hatred of Christians right now at an all-time high in the world, and um, again, uh, we are the ones who are speaking out. We are the ones who are being salt and light in this um, wicked and evil and putrefying world, and a lot of these laws that are being passed, even though they don't come out and say we are directing these laws at Christians— it's being directed at Christians because, again, we are the ones who are speaking up and we are the ones who are blowing the trumpet. And so it's just a matter of time before they start using these laws to arrest us and to put it and to put us in prison, Laura. And, you know, um, it's just a matter of time before they listen to shows like this with you and myself and maybe they, they try to come to your house and and arrest you for hate speech. I mean, it's just amazing when, when you try to tell people the truth um, that is now seen as hate. You know, and just speaking the truth now in this world is now a revolutionary act. You know, people would rather believe a lie than accept the truth. And um, it is um, it just goes to show you how far we have fallen and how far Canada has fallen. It's um, it's sad. You know, it's sad to yeah. see. Well, it is. And, you know, could lose our jobs eventually because of it as well, which is, yep. uh, you know, and which brings me, you know, you're going to talk about the next article about the. Um, the Canadian's top soldier. Yeah, apparently I heard about the um, the Canadian uh, the top soldier in Canada. He pretty much issued a directive encouraging that his soldiers can participate in um, in gay pride parades. Um, so now we see, as we see here in America, the Canadian military is now being used for social engineering and um, and for promoting all sorts of um, ungodliness and all sorts of wickedness. I know you have the article on that. You want to read? Yeah, it just says that the uniformed Canadian military personnel who march in Montreal's Pride Parade for the first time later this month will do so with the blessing of Canada's top soldier, according to a recent director from the Department of National Defence. In an effort to promote diversity and inclusion, the chief of the defence staff encourages all members of the CAF to attend and participate in Pride events in uniform, said the directive, which was written in June by General John, Jonathan Vance, 
Uh, Lieutenant Cole Sarah here, the Canadian Forces Director for Diversity and Human Rights, says the directive means soldiers no longer have to ask for permission to wear their uniforms at Pride events. There'll probably be chastisement eventually for the ones that don't want to. Yeah. You know, yeah. Bullying, and I, I could, it, it'll come to that. I've said before, you know, um, the military is to do one thing, fight and win wars. That's it. Military is not to be used as a social experiment. That's not what they're here for. They're here to fight and win wars. And the very fact that the head of the military is approving of this, you know, just like many um, generals here in America are approving of transgenderism and all of these different things, using the military for all all of these different uh, social um, social experiments. It's just um, it is grieving and it is it is just um, it makes your blood boil really for what they're doing. And as you said, Laura. For those um, soldiers who do not want to participate, eventually, I think um, I think they're going to be chastised and they're going to be um, shunned and they're probably going to be kicked out of the military, which is probably going to be good for them um, because they don't want to go along with this. You know, if they speak out against it in any way, if they raise their voices and say, listen, we don't agree with this. You know, I don't agree with this. You know, they're going to be um, they're going to be written up. They're going to be reprimanded and um, maybe, um, you know, kicked out of the military or disciplined in some way uh, because of it. And it's just um, it's this is just evil. I mean, this is just evil beyond imagination. But again, this is once you um, once once people start going down, once a country starts going down, it's um there's just no stopping it, you know, and as I said, once Canada started, just like America, once they started going in a certain direction, it's just um, unless an, an act of God happens, unless God has mercy on, on this nation and um, and he stops it, I mean, Canada, just like America, is going to go right in the gutter. You know, we're going to end up right in the cesspool, and it, it is sad to see. It really yeah. sad to see. Yeah, it's getting worse for sure. Well, on to another subject now. I know that um, Canada has now become the nation, um, the go-to nation for the refugees. A lot of refugees are, um, um, there's a huge refugee problem in the world right now. And your Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has literally flung the doors of Canada open to any and all refugees. And you guys, um, it's now out of control there. I mean, everyone now is streaming into Canada. I mean, people from all over the world. I mean, the door has been open. Justin Trudeau has basically um, basically said, come on in, and it's now out of control. And I know you have an article there to, um, talking about that. Yeah, I do. Um, it's actually a recent article. Uh, it just came out today. Uh, it's from the, uh, the Sun. Okay, the crisis of illegal immigration along the Canada-U.S. border has reached a new pinnacle. According to Customs and Immigration, Union President Jean-Pierre Fortin who represents Canada's border guards, as many as 500 people are illegally crossing into Quebec every day. More than 10,000 immigrants have walked across the border this year, choosing deliberately to cross at unofficial crossings to avoid the safe third country agreement between Canada and the U.S. The bilateral agreement requires that asylum seekers make their refugee claim in the first safe country they arrive in and not pass through one safe country to get to another. Far from stopping asylum claimants coming into Canada via the U.S., this agreement has simply led aspiring refugees to cross into Canada legally and circumvent our immigration rules. Mm. So I'll, I'll say about that, but um, yeah, I guess they're even being encouraged um, and coached in another article that said to, to cross illegally. Thank you, Justin Trudeau. Huh? Yeah, I know, Mark. Yeah, you guys have a winner for a prime minister. And I mean, it just seems as if it's funny where Donald Trump is being ripped apart because he's trying to um, stem the flow of um, refugees in this country, especially refugees from um, from countries that um, that are known to be hostile to America. You know, Syria and other countries and Libya and other countries, um, countries that have tried to um, do us harm. You know, uh, we fought we fought many of these countries on the battlefield and um, him trying to stop many of these refugees because we don't know who these people are you know he's seen as a hate monger he's seen as um xenophobic and everything like that and yet um yet your prime minister is just literally opening up the doors to all of these people and who knows who these people are 
I mean, who knows if these people are terrorists, if they're former ISIS fighters, because we know that ISIS has made it very clear that they're sending many of their fighters back to their home countries and back to just to any countries that will take them. And once they're once these uh, fighters go back to these countries, their aim, of course, is to bring destruction to those countries. So who knows who um, who many of these refugees are? I mean, Canada could be attacked um, pretty soon by some of these people who are pretending to be um um, asylum seekers because of war and yet once they get there they just start um, wreaking, wreaking havoc on your country I mean it's just um, this is insane because a nation that doesn't have uh, control over its borders um, it's just it's doomed to destruction and I think that's exactly what your prime minister is doing I think your prime minister is dooming along with everything else that's going on in your country he's dooming your country to destruction because of what these um, what these refugees are doing as a matter of fact I heard another um, story about a refugee a Syrian refugee um, who came in the country a couple of years ago in your country and um, apparently he got into an argument with his wife and he almost um, beat his wife to death with a hockey stick and um, and he was claiming ignorance. He was saying that he had no idea that he could not do that in Canada because in his country of Syria, he could do that. He could beat his wife with a, with a hockey stick. He, pro he could probably beat his wife to death and nothing would happen. And he pretty much got a slap on the wrist um, uh, um, because of what he did. I know you have the article on that. Yeah, that's exactly right what happened, Mark. Um, so it was the man was uh, Mohammed Rafia, a Syrian refugee. He didn't just beat his wife. He beat her with a hockey stick for half an hour. Mm. Uh, Rafia told a Frederick, uh, Fredericton court that he didn't know it was a crime in Canada to beat your wife with a hockey stick for half an hour. Uh, following the attack, Rafia's wife was taken to a local hospital and initially, initially lied to protect her husband. She later revealed that he beat her with a hockey stick for half an hour, pulled her hair, hit her in the face, and threatened to kill her. Rafia was charged and pleaded guilty to assault, causing bodily harm and uttering threats. He was sentenced to eight days in jail and one year of probation. Um, so it says here that uh, Rafia was a privately sponsored refugee who arrived in Canada more than 14 months ago with his wife and children. He spoke to the court in Arabic and his testimony was translated through an interpreter. He was not aware of the law and he was coming from a background where the laws are completely different. And listen to this. He said officials didn't inform him of the differences in the law in Canada and that more should should have been done to educate him. Why didn't they explain the law? Question mark. So it's basically the government's fault and not his fault. You know, right. we've, we've seen this over and over again with Muslims. Muslims never accept responsibility for anything that they do. What they do is they try to blame everybody else for their problems. So they do something and it's not their fault. It's because somebody else did something why they did what they did. Um, so you beat your wife with a hockey stick for half an hour and it's not your fault. It's the government fault for, for not telling you that you are not allowed to do that. I mean, this is just this is just bizarre. But unfortunately, your country, your country right now is being overrun with people with that kind of thinking because i said in the middle east you are allowed to beat your wife and even kill your wife if you want and you will just basically um either nothing will happen to you or you'll just um you get a slap on the wrist and then that's it and now we have people your country now has literally um tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people uh, st streaming in your country with that kind of uh thinking with that kind of ideology i mean god help your country and you know <laughs> Like I, I hear these people say, well, they're, you know, they're, they're going to assimilate into our country, you know, well, maybe some will, but there's lots that don't care to and don't want to. And their right. whole purpose is not to assimilate in our country. Right. You know? um, and I see people like, you know, from Canada, whatever, they're wearing the hijab or whatnot to try to make the Muslim feel comfortable. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if, if they want to assimilate in our country, why don't they wear our clothes and assimilate with us? If that's why are we changing to wear what they wear? Do, do you know what I'm saying? It, it, I'm right. Absolutely. It, it doesn't make sense. And why can't people see it? Uh, and if you speak up against it, you're, you know, I'm a hater right. and I'm not a hater. It's just, Right. Well, it's funny you brought that up because it goes into our next subject where the House of Commons, um, I know that the House of Commons in Canada, they right. passed um, they passed an anti-Islamophobia motion um, just a few months ago. It's not a law yet. 
they're saying it's not a law yet and it's not but it's just a matter of time before it does become a law but i know you have an article on that where they passed this um anti-islamophobia -Islam motion i think it was called m103 and you can uh, you can talk more about that laura yeah okay uh so what is m103 so um it's a motion it, it says here that the government should recognize the need to quell the increasing public climate of hate and fear the government should condemn islamophobia in all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination the standing committee on canadian heritage should look at how the government could develop an approach to reducing or eliminating systemic racism and religious discrimination, including Islamophobia, and collect data to contextualize hate crime reports. The committee should present its findings and recommendations to Parliament within 240 days. So basically, if the motion passes, the committee will study how to better tackle religious discrimination in Canada. That's it. It says the motion is, is not a bill and it will never become a law. Uh, the motion will not place any new restrictions on freedom of speech. So, right. And we should say that this was a couple of months ago, and I think it has been passed now. It was passed. Um, and again, you know, here we go with, with the Muslims. The Muslims are always crying racism. They're always crying, you know, that they're victims. You know, they're victims of everything. Um, the fact of the matter is that they're not the victims. We are the victims because they're the ones who bully everyone else um, to to conform to, to their ideology and to their beliefs. Um, and again, Laura, who's the ones who's speaking out against these people? Okay, it's the Christians. It's the Christians who are warning people about what the Muslims are doing. It's the Christians who are raising their voices and who are trying to tell people, listen, um, what these people are doing, are, these people are up to no good. These people are, um, these people are trying to change the West. They're, they're trying to change our culture into pretty much an Islamic culture. And, um, and any, kind of, um, any kind of speaking out against uh, Muslims is seen as hate. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how you say it. They view any kind of criticism at all, even if it's justified criticism, it doesn't matter. They view all kind of criticism as Islamophobia. And what they're trying to do, basically, is to shut you up. That's what they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to shut you up, and they're trying to... Um, you're trying to bully you and try to silence you into not into not speaking up in any way, shape, or form about the horrendous nature of Islam and what Islam is all about. And you you know, mark my words, you know, this is going to come back on the Christians because again, the Christians are the ones who are speaking up. We're the ones who are telling people and warning people about what the Muslims are about. And even though these laws are not, um, they don't come out and say it explicitly um, that. That they're directed at Christians. Make no mistake, they are directed at Christians because we are the ones who are warning people. And, it's, and as I said you know, several times before, it's not the Sikhs, it's not the Hindus, it's not the Buddhists, it's not any of these people. It's the Christians who are speaking up, the Christians who are blowing the trumpet, and it will come back to haunt us. Um, it will come back on our heads, and they are going to use these laws to bash us over the heads and ultimately to charge us with hate speech and maybe imprison us for speaking up against um, Islam and for or any um, any other group that we see as harmful to um, to our respective cultures. Yeah, that's right. And you're right; it was passed. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Well, and, you know, and um, go ahead, Laura. No, I was just gonna say, and it, it is very few Christians that are speaking up too. I don't. I think a lot of people are scared. A lot of it is a lot of it is getting people so scared that they don't want to speak up because they're afraid of what will happen. So just the idea of um, if you can scare people into not saying anything, they've already um, succeeded. Right. Well, look at 9-11. I mean, they used fear to succeed. And, and you know, it's just going from there. You think that right. people would have woken up, but right. they have. They've gone the other way. It, it's it is accomplished what they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that um, talk about terrorism and 9-11, um, just a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago in your country, um, you know, there was this bizarre and just the outrageous um, headline of what the Trudeau government did. Your prime minister um, apologized to a terrorist um, uh, by the name of Omar Kader, who um, who killed a Delta soldier, an, an American Delta soldier in um, in Afghanistan, I believe it was in 2000, um, 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. He was 16 years old at the time when he did this, so he um, he murdered this soldier, this American soldier in Afghanistan, and um, he was a Canadian citizen. And um, so what happened was he was he was sent to Guantanamo, and um, he was in prison for a while, and then he um, he finally confessed. I believe it was in 
in 2012 and yeah. he was serving his sentence in Canada and um by some bizarre turn he um he turned around he sued the Canadian government and um the Trudeau government paid him 10.5 million dollars just a couple of weeks ago and also apologized for him being in prison all the time i know you have an article that speaks more about that well that pretty much you pretty much <laughs> nailed it all the points mark um so it just says here that this week the government officially apologized to Mr. Kadar for the role Canadian security officials played in the abuses he suffered as a teenage prisoner of the U.S. military at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The apology came days after Ottawa paid $10.5 million to Mr. Kadar to settle a $20 million lawsuit he filed over uh, violations to his rights as a Canadian citizen. The apology and payment have been controversial. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has denounced the government for making a millionaire out of what he called a convicted terrorist. Justin Trudeau should never have agreed to a secret deal that gave a convicted terrorist millions of dollars. Seeking money from the Canadian taxpayer is just a sign of continuing contempt for the country that Qadar has fought against. Mr. Shear said this week, Mr. Kadar pleaded guilty in 2012 to killing U.S. Delta Forces Sergeant Christopher Spear so he could be moved to Canadian prison. He later recanted the conviction and is appealing the U.S. conviction. Mm. So that's just a little bit of the article there. Yeah, Justin Trudeau, your prime minister, is... Um I know, Mark. You know, he is... It just reminds me of President Obama, former President Obama. He is just... Um, the man's an embarrassment, really. He really is. I mean, I just don't understand what's going on with him. I mean, how he became prime minister is um, is beyond me. Um, but, you know, I well, think, again, wicked leaders are a judgment on wicked people. And so I think right. he's, um, you know, we, we've been judged by having bad presidents here in America. And I think uh, Trudeau is a judgment on Canada, um, you know, because, again, wicked leaders are a judgment on wicked people. So, um well, and Mark, I mean, we're going to talk about the next article here, but um, about the pot legalization. But that's one reason why people voted for Trudeau, and it just goes to show you the morals of the people. The majority, the majority voted for him, so mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's what they want. That's this right. is what they're getting. They, they're, they, you know, whether it's to the extent that they thought they wanted, but right, but they're they're getting what they voted for. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember when he was running for prime minister two years ago, at the heart of his campaign was pot legalization. I mean, right. that was at the heart of his campaign. And as you said, I'm sure a lot of people went, oh, yeah, great. We're going to vote for this guy because he's going to make pot legal. And I know that um, where you live in B.C., Laura, that you, you guys have a massive, massive uh, drug ep epidemic, especially in the town where you live. And it's just um, and to see the government, you know, approving of this and just um, and see the prime minister, you know, what what he wants to do is he wants to legalize drugs even more. It's just um, it's just bizarre to me. It's just bizarre to me that he's doing that. It's not enough now that uh, that people are hooked on drugs, but now they're getting their pets hooked on drugs because we know now that there's a thing, there's a growing trend in Canada uh, for pots, for pot for pets, you know, um, to um, feeding pot, you know, marijuana, giving uh, marijuana to your pets as treats and stuff like that. I know you have the um, article on that. And the veterinarians, of course, are warning about this and saying, you know, this is wrong. This is going to be harmful uh, to the pets. So as I said, it's not enough for the people to be hooked on drugs. They are now trying to get their animals to be hooked on drugs. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, uh, it just says that uh, one medical marijuana dispensary in Toronto said it's so popular it's flying off the shelves. Uh, we sell it in the form of biscuit or liquid. Uh, many of the pet owners who come in are looking to help their pets with ailments such as anxiety, inflammation, cancer, and even end-of-life care. Um, even if the cannabis does not have THC, we do not know it's safe. Um, okay, this is talking about a veterinary. So they're, they're against it, the veterinaries. Mm -hmm. um, and they're saying that uh, the veterinary clinic has seen many dogs and cats come in sick and have toxic side effects, even due to ingesting the drug. They come in heavily sedated, cannot lift their heads, have low heart rate, and for some even have seizures. She said cannabis can be toxic for animals. Yeah. So in spite of the warnings, they're still pushing it and making it cool or, you know, 
for health benefits. You know, this just um, this just makes my blood boil because, as you know, Laura, I'm an animal lover. I love animals, yeah. and um, the very fact that they're doing this to our pets, doing this um, to, to their pets, you know, again, it's not enough. Um, for them to be hooked on drugs and to be taking all these drugs, but now they want their pets to be hooked on drugs too. I mean, these people are evil. They're beyond evil. Um, and as I said, I'm an animal lover. So when I see any kind of um, abuse to animals in any way, it just makes my blood boil. And I just, um, I mean, what is happening to us? I mean, what's happening to us as a people? Of course, I know that I'm just, I'm saying that, um, I'm just throwing that up, but I know this is a spiritual, this is a spiritual problem. This, it, this shows sin. This, this is the um, evil fruits of sin and sin will rear its head in all, in all forms of um, evil and all for in all manner. And it's just, um, it's just, um, it's just disgusting when you think about what they're doing to the animals now, you know, again, um, it's not enough for them to be hooked on drugs, but now they're trying to get their animals to be hooked on drugs. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it affects your mind, right? People say it does. It really does. And, and uh, I think our welfare system is going to go through the roof because if people are hooked on pot, then a lot of them don't want to work or they, or they mm. can't make their judgments off. And of course I, I know people, I mean, I have people I see every day that are hooked on this stuff and that's their life. Yeah. It, it revolves around marijuana. It's very yeah. sad. You know. well, like I said, you know, um, Laura, we could have talked about so many other things, but I think this kind of gives people an idea as to where Canada is going. And I mean, 20 years ago, you would have, I mean, you'd have shocked me if you'd have uh, told me that these things would have been happening in Canada. You know, I mean, I never saw this coming, but you know, once, um, once you start going down the, the, the slope, I mean, it just, um, there's no ending. It's, it's like an avalanche, you know, it just, um, it'll just take away everything, just consume everything. And that's exactly what's happening in Canada. And, you know, um, again, there's a revolution happening in that country and it's, um, it's not good. And it's, um, you know, we need to pray for the leaders, of course, of your country. We need to pray for the leaders of, of my country, too, of, of America and, you know, all the other leaders. You know, the Bible makes it very clear in First um, Timothy chapter 2, verses um, 2 through 4, that we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for their salvation, pray that they come to the foot of the cross and be saved. And, you know, it just really breaks my heart to see what's happening in your country. Because, again, as I said at the beginning, you know, Canada, your country was once seen as a, as a very quiet and sleepy um neighbor to um to our north but um what has become of your country just over the last um 15 to 17 years is just um nothing short of a uh, heartbreaking and just wrenching and um mark did you also want to mention about the safe injection sites um well you can you can, you can mention that yeah just going along with the pot and all that but they do have in surrey uh, they have a safe injection site to prove to supervise snorting drugs or taking them orally. Uh, two Surrey drug injection sites become the first of its kind to get approval from Health Canada to allow users to snort illicit substances or take them orally under medical supervision. So it says here that it's a move. Provincial Health Officer Dr. Perry Kendall says that will save more lives. Um, the ability to supervise the consumption of substances Substances, whether it be injection, oral, or intranasal methods, means more overdoses will be reversed and more lives will be saved. Um, so it's basically a site you go to, these booths are set up, and they have nurses there, but they also have what's called a naloxone kit, um, which is a drug that reverses the effects of an overdose. So, you know, these people go there knowing that it's available and that they could, if they OD, hey, it's okay. We we have nurses there. We got the naloxone kit. If I overdose, they'll bring me out of it. So, I, I no wonder it's an epidemic. It's not going to get better. I mean. Because the government yeah. is the one that, that's providing all of this, right? Right. And I mean, I have no problem with, okay, you overdose, let's help these people. I have no problem with that. It's just to me you're dealing with drug users and you're giving them the, the mentality. There's no fear now. Right. It's, mm. it's all, it's okay. Right. Yeah. You have that safety net there. Yeah. You can come it, on in, you can do your, you can do all your illicit drugs here and we're going to be here to watch you just in case you overdose. Right. <laughs> I mean, like that's yeah. where the money's going. It's just, I, yeah. I don't know. Mark. I, I know. just don't know what to say. As I said, Laura, it's a snowball effect. Once you start going down this, in this direction, that's it. There's just no stopping it. You know, so Mark, I'll let you give the gospel because that's that's our only hope. 
Well, as I said, you know, the Bible makes it very clear that, that uh, we need to pray for the leaders who are um, leading the charge in many of these areas. And, you know, Christ paid for all sins on the cross. You know, it doesn't matter if you engage in drugs. It doesn't matter if you're a fornicator, a trans, a quote unquote, transgender. Um, it doesn't matter um, what you engage in. The, the Bible makes it very clear that Christ died for all sins. And um, if you see your sinfulness, if you realize that you're a sinner, that you realize that um, that there's nothing that you can do to save yourself you know the bible makes it very clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of god there's nothing that you can do to save yourselves you cannot do good works you cannot um moral you cannot go into moralism nothing that you can do you have to go to the foot of the cross and if you do that in simple faith you realize that you're a sinner you can't save yourself. You realize that you need to be saved. You need to be forgiven. The Bible makes it very clear that if you simply go to the foot of the cross and you just believe the gospel, when the gospel is preached to you, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he rose from the grave on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. If you simply believe the gospel, you will be saved. All we have to do is just believe. Just simply believe. Believe that Jesus died for you, was buried, and rose rose again. And if you do that in simple faith, you will be saved. Nothing more, nothing less. Do not add any works to it. Do not add before or after. It's simple belief in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, anyone, I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what you are hooked on now. If you go to the cross, you will be saved. All you have to do is simply believe. And we encourage anyone, anyone who's listening to this right now, who's not saved, we urge you to go to the cross, believe the gospel, and be saved. Yeah, amen. And um, I, I do still love being a Canadian. I just wanted to say that. And I love living here. And um, I just try to be salt and light whenever I can and preach the gospel when I can. And that's amen. what I'm trying to do. Yeah. 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 Again, I know that um, what we talked about today was very grieving, was very heartbreaking, was very sad. But um, I think, you know, we need to blow the trumpet. We need to warn people and let people know exactly what's going on, because a lot of people really don't know what's going on. So hopefully we open some eyes today. And um, I just ask you right now just to pray for your country, whatever country you're in. You know, pray for you need to pray for your leaders, pray for their salvation, pray that they would come to the foot of the cross and be saved. All right. So, again, I know that um, we spoke about a lot of grieving subjects today but um hopefully we can uh, turn the page um next week and we can talk about some other things all right so um laura i think that's it and um we will definitely pick it up next week yeah thank you thanks everybody for listening and god bless you all okay take care guys bye-bye